Hi everyone. This is the module for the Master of Public Health um, publication and scholarly communication workshop about recognizing predatory publishing. This is a customized version of a presentation that I give around campus, our campus here at the Health Sciences Center in Shreveport. And I want to tell you how this, what this is, and how it got to be such a problem. Um, my objectives for this are that you all will be able to list three characteristics of predatory publishers, know how to apply criteria from the Think Check Submit framework when you're evaluating publication opportunities. I want to give you some idea of the size of the research-based estimates of the number of predatory publishers and predatory articles. I want to list at least two of the tools for you that can help you evaluate the quality of publications and describe how to seek additional help from the library. So for context, I'm not here to criticize anyone's publications. And my goal with this part of the presentation, or with this part of the workshop, and with the workshop overall, is to help you make educated choices. And I want to start with a story. We've probably all received if you haven't, you will, emails like this, and you can tell that they're sort of a, they're just pulling my user ID from the campus. It's asking me to present at an international conference. I got one of these about, I had one forwarded to me about two years ago from a faculty member here on campus. It was asking her to provide a lot of personal information in a chance, in chance to explain, or in a chance to present a paper in Hungary and she wasn't comfortable with it she forwarded it to me before she filled anything out and asked if it looked legitimate to me so I decided to visit the conference website it turned out I picked three people who were listed on the planning committee at random and I emailed them with the United States email addresses two of them responded the ones who were the two who did respond said that they did not know that they had been listed on the conference planning committee website. So I did tell our faculty member I didn't think she should provide any information. And it's a good lead-in to talk about how this has become a problem and why it's a problem. So these kinds of aggressive email tactics and fake websites and things like that. It's really a result of increasing scholarly output, just more things being published. So-called open access models of publishing, which is really just a model of publishing that passes along some costs of publishing to the author. And then there's an IT infrastructure that enables rapid publishing. And all of those things come together to make some confusion and also to lure unsuspecting people in to giving money to fraudulent publications. The IT infrastructure it now makes it much faster to do that. If you go to Google Sites, you can get a custom domain starting at $12 a month. And so I'll give you a, an example of that later, but just wanted to show you sort of the confluence of things where this started happening. There's no great single definition of it. A predatory publisher, I like this one from a colleague of mine, a predatory publisher is an opportunistic publishing venue that exploits the academic need to publish but offers little reward for using their services. And as far as the size of this, the research-based estimates I'm able to find, they're a little older now, but they estimate about 420,000 articles in predatory journals in 2014. There's probably about 8,000 active journals. This became such a problem that the National Institutes of Health actually issued a statement, which you can go read, about their preferences and expectations about where you publish when you're using, when you're publishing NIH-funded research. Unfortunately, there's no single list of all predatory publishers. It's problematic to track these, and again, it's all too easy to create a website that appears legitimate, as I mentioned. There was a list being maintained through early 2017 called Bell's List. Uh, 
it's a person's last name. Um, Jeffrey Bell was a librarian in Colorado. Um, there's some question about whether he was asked to take his list down or not. There are other people who have taken it on on this website, this Weebly website, but it's becoming stale. As far as publishing medical case study journals, um, Dr. Akers, who herself is a, trained as a neuroscientist, um, she did a pretty big article on medical case study journals that have questionable publishing practices. And she's got them stratified by um, questionable publishing practices, um, whether they're open access, and a few other criteria. Um, she's probably the last article of that type that I saw. There's a lot of different ways, if you just Google it, to identify potentially predatory journals. What I like is for East to remember is because it says think, check, submit, and this is actually a website. And I, for the purposes of this, I put the logo here, but there's some, I wanted to make sure that I actually pull out the checklist and talk a little bit about it. And so you should think about this when you're approached for publication opportunities. Do you or your colleagues know the journal? Can you easily identify and contact the publisher? And that includes in multiple ways. Is the journal clear about the type of peer review it uses? Are the articles indexed in services that you use? A lot of predatory publishers will refer to things that you may never have heard of. Um, and I'll give you some examples here shortly. Is it clear what fees will be charged? Um, is it clear what the fees are for and when they will be charged? To me, it's a big red flag if you're being asked to pr give money up front. And I would really discourage you from doing that if you're in a role where you can do that. Do you recognize the editorial board? Is the publisher a member of a recognized industry initiative? And I went ahead and listed all the, the ones here, all of which have their own websites, Committee on Publication Ethics, Directory of Open Access Journals, Open Access Scholarly Publication, Publishers Association. And these are more regional ones for um, um, these countries that are mentioned here and also African journals online for journals published in Africa or is it a member of another trade association that you can verify. As far as potentially predatory conferences, which is another type of aggressive email that we get, this is from, and my reading list will be in the Google website or in the Google course. Um, this is from a person at the London School of Economics, and he's listed several different things to think about when you're approached about presenting at a conference, presenting your work. Um, are you aware of the society? Is it the first time it's ever been held? Is it clear the fees that will be charged? Are there sponsors? Uh, is the conference website organized appropriately? Have you ever heard of papers from this conference's proceedings before? Is there clear information about the timeline and agenda for the conference? Have you ever heard of any keynote speakers? Is there an editorial committee listed on the website? Remember that, like I gave the example at the beginning, the editorial committee members, their names could just be lifted from reputable websites and put there without their knowledge. They should provide you be nice if they provided you with some idea about where the conference proceedings are going to be published. Um, is the publisher that oversees that a member of some of the recognized industry initiatives that were listed on the previous um, about two or three slides ago? And so here's the fun part where I get to pull up some examples, and these are actually things I took from journals that have questionable practices. This is an abstracting and indexing description. The problem with this that I have is that it's mentioning some real databases. Um, I haven't heard of DBLP, but I don't know what Open OpenJGate is. Um, one thing I would mention is that I looked up about Google Scholar, and there really isn't an application process the way they have listed there. Um, abstracting and indexing services to become a science citation index journal, usually the science citation index from, well, it's, it's now called Clarivet Analytics, but it used to be the Institute for Scientific Information. They um, 
require at least a minimum of three full years of publication before they'll consider you for indexing. So at this month or weeks is not an appropriate timeline. My problem with this is that these aren't journals. These are, and you don't know what you're getting when it just says order now. Um, these are books. They have ISBNs attached to them. And I just wouldn't click on anything that just blindly says order now. This form usually gets some laughs. Please submit your manuscript in whatever format that it is as soon as possible. Do not spend your time to figure out about our template, and that's my highlighting. I realize that's crooked. That made me laugh. But um, And it's got all this information. And then also, would you like to become a reviewer to Insight Core? And then it's asking you to upload a file. So I, again, when it's a blind form like this that you don't know where it's going, I would not submit any information. I would not give them a Microsoft Word or a PDF document of research that you haven't published yet. Um, this is an example of one of the criteria covering too many subject areas. This covers everything. Uh, they claim this, this journal will take articles on all of these topics and it takes four year you know, colleges and universities decades to develop programs in these, so it's not very likely that you could have substantive contributions in every single one of these subjects. <clears throat> the submit processing fee for article publication, this is another example of just a blind form and it just says pay now manuscript number, mobile number, I, I would not give out your mobile telephone number if you don't already know that because you never know what's going to be done with it. There are some other strategies beyond just the Think Check Submit framework. These are a little advanced but they're worth knowing about. You can try to verify the publisher address on Google Maps or through property tax rolls if the municipality, at least in the United States, may have they may be required to have publicly searchable property tax rolls with people's addresses. The, the trick with this is that sometimes Google Maps has some really good information, like a colleague of mine who was looking up a supposed publication opportunity, and the Google Maps Street View showed that it was really just an apartment building somewhere in the suburbs. That kind of raises a red flag. You can try to look up the URL using Whois tools, although if somebody has requested that it be private, it may not ever, you may not be able to get any information, but sometimes you will be able to find out who's responsible for purchasing a, a custom URL. You can try to look up the dissertations of people if they have doctoral level degrees um, listed on planning committees or editorial boards. If they're clinicians, are they licensed to practice or board certified? Uh, our Health Sciences Library does have the Online American Board of Medical Specialties directory. Is it even feasible to present or publish in the venue? And the reason I, there's an administrative directive in the LSU system, or at least for this campus, that all international travel has to be approved by the campus level chancellor. And that takes a significant amount of time. It can also take a significant amount of time to get a visa or the permissions to travel overseas. Some of the deadlines that you're given in these aggressive emails may not be reasonable. If you're still stumped, we recommend that you ask the library. And I would say if you're spending more than five to ten minutes, what can we do for you specifically? We can show you how to research a publication or conference, or we can do it for you. And that is something that we do routinely. Most people who are legitimately doing research are delighted to be asked about it. This is the third of the learning objectives I have where it says um, what tools can you use. The library does subscribe to journal citation reports which gives you something that are popularly called impact factors. We also subscribe to ProQuest dissertations and theses. We also subscribe to something called the serials directory that comes through EBSCO that does have an indicator about whether uh, it does have address and like, the listings of addresses of publications and then it also has some indicators about whether they're peer-reviewed or not. And like I said, we can contact editors or conferences on your behalf. I think it's a pretty safe bet that if we don't get an answer, that probably is an answer. Um, and I would just again discourage you from giving money up front. 
to any of these things, please contact us if uh, we might be able to find a, a better alternative for you. And another questionable tactic that's worth mentioning, this is a more recent email from earlier this year. Universe Scientific Publishing, for what it's worth, is actually listed and was listed on Bell's list of predatory publishers that was way back on the Think Check Submit slides. This is a, another aggressive marketing tactic, and, and this is just not an appropriate way. Usually you don't solicit editorial board members through some sort of blind email like this. And then also you see the big, one of the big other red flags for me is just this Gmail address. Um, I don't, and they're asking for something that isn't really appropriate. I'm not a nurse. I don't really, wouldn't really sit on an editorial board of a journal of nursing unless there was some reason for it that they just needed it. But this is just sort of a cold call way of doing this. And these are becoming Sometimes these come hand in hand with requests to publish in these outlets, but I wanted to show you an example of what these look like. So I hope this was helpful. Your Google Classroom is going to have some practice for you, and this is the final module before you can take your quiz for the second week.